Earlier this month, peace talks between South Sudan's warring sides failed to reach a deal to end a civil war which has claimed tens of thousands of lives in the world's youngest nation. Last week, the United States proposed implementing a U.N. arms embargo on South Sudan and new sanctions unless the government signs a peace deal to end the conflict. South Sudan is the subject of a new documentary about modern-day colonialism in Africa. Austrian director Hubert Sauper's We Come as Friends provides an aerial view of the conflict in Sudan from a shaky, handmade, two Cedar Plain. The film depicts American investors, Chinese oilmen, United Nations officials and Christian missionaries struggling to shape Sudan according to their own visions, while simultaneously applauding the alleged independence of the world's newest state. What emerges is a devastating critique of the consequences of cultural and economic imperialism. The film has just made its theatrical debut in New York and will be opening in select theaters nationwide. BBC Worldwide North America has acquired full rights to the film. Well, Democracy Now! As Nermeen Sheikh and I recently sat down with director Hubert Sauper to discuss We Come as Friends. The film took him six years to make. His 2004 film, Darwin's Nightmare, was nominated for an Academy Award. I began by asking Hubert Sauper about the message he hopes to convey in this new film. We Come as Friends is my latest, latest film. The title itself uh, includes already this most cynical line that you can imagine of somebody trying to take over a land and say, we're here as your friend, we just want to help, which is basically the case. And um, We Come As Friends is a, is a, is a uh, tentative, uh, uh, I was trying to, to describe the pathology, the pathological mindset of colonialism, which is not over, it's, it's still happening. And one of the uh, elements uh, that are very important of, of col colonialism is, of course, land grab. It's, it's, uh, colonialism is taking the land of someone else, and not only the land, but also the workforce and the control over the people on the land. So I, I found this specific uh, story of one specific land grab in South Sudan, as South Sudan became independent. Of, of 600,000 acres being taken away from a local community, basically, by one contract, by one company, by one man, basically, from Texas. And Anurada and the Oakland Institute had, had re researched that, and I was trying to basically track down. It took me a week to find this, this, this community in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> uh, go there with my little airplane, which, <laughs> which, I, which I had to, to make the movie. Wait, wait. Uh, <clears throat> Before and, and we continue with this, you can't <laughs> just uh, gloss over that. Yeah. This, in your previous films, you're always showing airplanes as yeah. sort of a symbol of globalization and also what comes in and out of a country, yeah. whether it's weapons going in and resources going yeah. out. But here, you made your own plane. Yeah. How? Well, well it's, not, it's not rocket science to make an, a very low— I think it is rocket science. It's, it's, not, it's, not, rec, it's <laughs> not rocket science. It's, it's kind of rocket science to make a documentary film, I must say. But it is not rocket science to, to make a little airplane, uh, for, which is built, like, in the 1920s, you know, it, and it has a little engine. It carries two people. Wasn't if, it an if, engine used for a drone? Well, the same engines are used for drones, actually. They're made in, in, in Europe, but that's another story. So I was a bit of uptight because I was, could have been mistaken by being a drone, you know. But we were in it. It was not unmanned. It was manned by two filmmakers, myself and, and my co-pilot, Barney Broomfield, who is a very fine filmmaker from America. And. Uh, so, and he dared to get in this plane with you from he, your home outside uh, Paris? Yeah, he dared, because he, he knew we were working on the film, and he's dedicated to filmmaking, and he was, he was actually sweating and terrified by airplanes, but he learned how to fly over, over the civil war zone, basically. You uh, flew from your home in Paris uh, to— well, well, I've got a small little old farm in, in outside of Paris, in Burgundy, and I, I started to build with my little film crew this airplane called Sputnik. Sputnik is the Russian word for the companion. <laughs> um, I don't know, you may have pictures of it, you know. And with, from my backyard, I took off with this airplane to Tunisia, to Libya, which was still in the hands of Gaddafi. It was not, not a very pleasant uh, experience, I must say. I had to, it took me a month to go through Libya and through Egypt. I had to deal with a lot of, you know, very half-crazy people or totally crazy people in uniforms. 
and I had to explain that I was not working for Mossad, not for the CIA, and uh, I couldn't— Why would they be crazy to think that? I mean, this little plane that's flying over one country yeah. after another, I don't think it would be allowed in the United States. Well, it certainly would not be. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, if, if I were the CIA, I would maybe come up with this kind of ideas, you know, but I'm not working for the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I don't want to be hired by them, you know, so. I don't think they. I don't think they want to hire me anyway. So, um, but as a filmmaker, what you have to do as a filmmaker is to come up with an idea, and to come up with a way to find access to your idea, to access to your subjects, and access to your locations. You know, and when you want to make a film in a war-torn zone like Sudan. Uh, and you start calling the Minister of Information and say, can I have an official invitation or something? Uh, two weeks later, there's another Minister Inf of Information. For, first of all, second, uh, the Minister of Information, the old one, asks you for $10,000 for a letter. So you don't even start doing that. This is, this is, it's, it's not working. So basically, you have to, to come up with some kind of anarchist approach, you know, because it is, a, it is an area of anarchy anyway. So if you're not an anarchist yourself, you're, you're eaten, <laughs> literally and figuratively, or shot. You know, so so you have to kind of find a way to infiltrate in an environment which is hostile, but which you can still be in. You know, so how can you how can you film um, uh, Chinese oil fields uh, in the middle of nowhere, where, where there's no access to roads? Um, in Sudan. In Sudan, when all around there's shooting and civil war. You have to kind of find a way to get there. You have to be friends with the president of China, or you, have, you can also just fall from the sky and say, well, I'm here, guys, so and I'm, I'm sorry, I had, to, I had to land and make friends. And usually the people—I mean, there's, there are really friendly people everywhere. And when you can make people laugh, you know, like, because our, our plane was so small and ridiculous that everyone was, like, laughing at us. Including ourselves, it's it's just like a, like a big joke, it's, and it's kind of a Trojan horse, and it's it's the whole thing is a joke, you know. And we we, we wore um, you know pilots' uniforms. Uh, at one point, we, we we didn't do this in the beginning, but at one point we were so harassed by by military every time we landed somewhere, landing as nice nice guys from France with our own airplane, and 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 they wouldn't believe us that we were just making a film. So we ended up dressing up as as pilots, airline pilots, with 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 four stripes. I had I put myself four stripes as a, as a captain on my shoulders, <laughs> like like the dictators who put their own crowns on, and it was so it was so ridiculous, and we were just just laughing. We were just this is so odd, you know. And then as, as soon as we got to the next military camp. The soldiers would salute us, and uh, the com commander would invite us for tea, and uh, and, and and they would call us captain, and, and so and so. Suddenly, we we had kind of mutated ourselves into what we, what what I hate most. I can't stand uniforms. It's the worst. Thing. <laughs> and uniforms, as itself, is a theme of the film because uniforms is a colonial, is a part of the colonial legacy. Uh, the colonizers came and put, you know naked people into dresses and uniforms and boots and lockstep and all this stuff is a colonial is, is a part of the colonial legacy. Let's go back to the issue of uh, land grabs and play a clip from mm -hmm. uh, We Come As Friends. In this scene, a tribal leader in South Sudan comes to understand that he's leased about 2,300 square miles of community land to a Dallas-based company called the Nile Trading and Development Corporation, or NTD. The contract is explained to him by a group of political activists from Juba. NTD has full rights to exploit all natural resources in the leased land. This includes, one, right to develop, produce and exploit timber forestry resources on the list it is written that they will cut the trees on your land right to engage in agricultural activities the cultivations of bifoil crops and palm oil trees four right to exploit explore develop mine produce and all exploit uh, exploit uh, petroleum natural gas and other hypo uh, hydrocarbons resources for both local and export markets mm. for 75,000 Sudanese pounds, equivalent to approximately 
US dollars 25,000. That was a clip from WeCommerce Friends. The amount of land that was sold, 2,300 square miles, is approximately the equivalent of the greater metropolitan Chicago area. Uh, Hubert Zauber, can you talk about that um, and the significance of these land grabs in, in Sudan, South Sudan? As I said before, the, the, this specific uh, one single land deal I, I, I knew about through the research of the Oakland Institute, which is based in America. And uh, this contract was very officially signed by the government of South Sudan, uh, or Southern Sudan then. Um, and when it became known, through the Oakland Institute uh, and through the BBC, actually, the BBC had made a, a show about it, a, a radio show about it, then the government of Southern Sudan suddenly, suddenly started to, to be afraid, started to kind of back out, and they, they said, well, it's not it was a mistake, and we're, the, the contract is now uh, neutralized. You know? But it doesn't mean that things are now fine. It just means that there's going to, going to be another contract, another layer of another attempt. You know, it's not. It's not. But this specific contract actually was apparently is out of of uh, is no longer valid because of the work of the Oakland Institute and because of the the, the, the BBC. Uh, coverage of it. That's it, you know. And, and me as a filmmaker, I was there um, uh, with this group of, 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 of activists, and we read out the, 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 the content of the contract to the man who had signed it, who had signed off his land, who was apparently unaware of what he was had been signing, and who was kind of forced to sign. And it's not. And, the, and why I used this in the movie is not to kind of denounce the terrifying reality of this very contract. I was, I was trying to make a link to another historic legacy to colonialism, which was the technique of how to steal somebody's land. Again, the King Leopold of, of, uh, of Belgium, for example, he was using the services of Morton Stanley, the famous uh, explorer. He sent the, the King Leopold sent Morton Stanley into the Congo and said, you, you sail up the river Congo and you, you take all the local chiefs and you make all of them sign off their land to the king of, 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 uh, of Belgium. And those people at that time, 120 years ago, of course didn't know how to write, you know. So they put down the, the fingerprints, uh, the, the colonialists or, or the Stanley's assistants would hold their hands and, and kind of make some kind of signature. And that was the end of many cultures, you know. And it was the end of, of the life of millions of, of Congolese, by the way, because then they became uh, they became uh, uh, forced labor. They had to produce uh, a caoutchouc, how do you say, uh, 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 rubber for for export at the time. And uh, and it, it was just another example. But this, these kind of things are always referred to as historic. And and like like I said, New York was sold off for for a piece of uh, for a cup of tea or something, you know. And and it's not historic. It's 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 present. It's happening today. And land grab is a very very terrifying today reality. The yeah. center of Africa is 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 in great danger to be taken over by by foreign powers, by companies, by. By, by companies, by countries, by you countries. talk about um, China, and you talk about the United States. Let's yeah. go to another clip. This is yes. the U.S. ambassador to South Sudan, Barry Walkley, speaking at the opening of a new power plant in Kapeta, near the Kenyan border. At one point, his address is interrupted by a protester. The people of the United States of America, I'm delighted to congratulate the organizers of this timely event. The, the Capuensia power plant can today serve approximately 725 customers through 20 kilometers of completed electric lines. In the future, we'll be able to serve... <laughs> Get him out. This morning, in the north, there have been several references to light during the opening prayer. 
Reverend Father talked about light. The county commissioner, in his remarks, also spoke of the importance of light. The children sang songs of light. Those remarks, those references to light, were literally and figuratively appropriate because today we are literally and figuratively bringing light bringing light the u.s ambassador to south sudan barry walkley describe this whole scene for us yeah again the we come as friends is is a is a, is a study of the pathology of colonialism and and a lot of things that we, if you're if you're a part of a pathology, all of us, I would say, uh, you don't necessarily realize the the grave uh, the, the implication of what 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 you say sometimes, you know. And uh, one of the things that the colonizers did was using religion. The the Arabs were using Islam, uh, and the West or let's say the, the Europe or America were using Christianity as a tool. And the, the argument. Of Christianity was we have to bring peace, we have to bring civilization, we have to bring God and light versus darkness. Africa was always referred to as the dark continent or the black continent or the shadow land or whatever. So we 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 were obviously civilized and the light and and the, these words are are so engraved into into our souls that the the, gov the, 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 the ambassador of the United States speaks it out. He says, literally and figuratively, we bring light, saying we, we, we will ele electrify your village, and then you will become civilized and, and not as savage anymore, as, as, as you can see. I'm not saying this, I'm just quoting. Um, so w what is behind it? I don't know. It's good intention. I mean, I don't think—I think, I think it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's an elegant— person, this ambassador, you know, he's he's doing what he has to do. He works for his country. He brings the, the good words. He says, we come as friends. He opens a, a, a power station and electricity in an area, by the way, where people are starving and we're, we're dying from famine. In, in this very uh, proximity of this electric power station, people are dying from starvation, which is, which is not the fault of <laughs> And, 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 I mean, I'm not blaming the ambassador. I'm just saying that, that there's these realities are so crazy. And when you think of it, why, of all places, in this very village, Capueta, was suddenly a, an electric power station? Um, and there may be a connection, and I'm, I'm just suggesting something which I, which I cannot prove now, but the f three quarters or—, or or so of all the reserves of gold in South Sudan, and it's a, it's a huge amount of gold, and three quarters of that gold is in this very spot around Capueta. That's, you talked yeah. about the role of uh, Christianity and of missionaries yes. um, in colonialism. So I want to play another mm -hmm. clip from We Come as Friends. Here, an evangelist from Oklahoma is preaching to a group of students in his missionary school in that same small town uh, of Capueta, near the Kenyan border in, in South Sudan. I want to tell you all uh, that I am very proud of you. We need leaders who are young men and women of God. Who trust in God and know that He will answer your prayers. When what I want is what God wants, that means when I pray, I'm praying just like Jesus prayed. So that you believe that whatever you pray for, God will do. But you know what the first requirement is for God to answer your prayers? First, you must allow him to change your heart. My heart has to change. Okay. 
That was a clip from uh, We Come as Friends. Hubert Zauber, can you talk about the uh, significance of these American evangelicals in South Sudan? Significance? Um, well, again, you know, We Come as Friends is a film about the mindset of colonialism and about the, 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 the mechanism of colonialism. And, and European colonialism was, was very much accompanied and driven and supported by religious ideas and religious forces and religious people. And uh, so, as it happens today, um, the center of Africa is being fought over by many uh, empires, you know. China wants the oil. Uh, many Asian countries want the oil. Uh, Arabic countries also want land to grow food, because uh, you don't grow much food in Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, and these, uh, these, these countries are some, a lot of times using religion also to, to, to come to certain regions. South Sudan was, per def definition, colonized, I mean, by the North Sudan over many years. The North Sudanese governments, Muslim uh, Islamic regimes, were trying to send Islamic missionaries to South Sudan, were trying to, to make sure that naked children wear uh, clothes and wear uniforms and march in step. Um, they gave them guns, you know, to fight, etc. And now, the, we, the Western people, are just doing the same. You know, we are sending our missionaries. Uh, they are also trying to dress up you know, naked children, they're trying to make it, give them uniforms. We are giving those people arms, and then they go after each other, and then we call it tribal wars. Hmm. And the tribal wars, like now, at this very moment in South Sudan, there is tribal clashes. There is terrible tribal clashes, because two tr between two tribes, the Dinkas and the Nuer. Why are they fighting? They're really fighting because the warlord of the Dinkas and the Nuer, the warlord, the chief of the Dinkas, basically, the, 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 is, is the president of South Sudan at this moment, and his opponent is, is called uh, Riyak Mashar. He's, he's a Nuer. And, and to make a long story short, these warlords are fighting over who has the control over the resources and who has the power. And then they're taking the whole country hostage, and, and they're saying, we are the Nuer, we are the Dinka. We should go after the others, and 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 in the reports, and then and, and in the American press, and in the even in the BBC, all you hear is about the new era are fighting at the, against the Dinkas, and basically suggesting those savage Africans fight against each other. And now what we have to do is come in, bring the UN, and bring the missionaries, and bring peace. But nobody really talks about the the the, the source of the problem is already the presence of money and people who want the oil and people who give. The arms to people to these. And what groups, about the competition between China and the United States? The same pattern, same story. You know, uh, the Sudan, the Sudan uh, was split into two into two countries in 2011, um, and coincidentally, the new border cuts through exactly through the places where there's oil. I don't know why. Can you explain why? The north and the south Sudan are split up, and, the, and exactly the new border, which divides, which is, you know, divide and rule is a part of, uh, of the problem in Africa. Borders are a part of the problem. So this new border was created. It's 2,000 kilometers long. Um, and as soon as it had been created, it was on fire, because it's where the oil is. And uh, the end of my movie, We Come as Friends, is, by the way, the first, the end of my movie is the first war on the border. Between, uh, between the North Sudan and the South Sudan. And now, actually, at, at this point, the South Sudan in, in itself is on fire. And again, two you know, groups and warlords are fighting over, basically fighting over oil. That's Hubert Sauper, director of We Come as Friends. The film has just opened in theaters now.